May I should start? Yes, you can start. Okay. Okay, so good morning to everyone. I already had a chat with some of you, but <laughs> not good all. Morning. Are you listening okay? Otherwise, I'll put my headphones, but I prefer to do it like this. If you hear um, well, I'll, think I'll, okay. I'll go like this. Okay. So, um, thanks for being here. Today, I will uh, try to share with you uh, some of the work we do in terms of uh, nature-based solutions for environmental challenges and I'll go mostly to um, to water, the water sector. So this is a part of the research we do at uh, the university. It's probably the smallest part and most of the research is not uh, than on site because we've got to have the this this kind of solutions implemented uh, um, where they are needed um, but it, it's one of my favorite subjects not to what i do most but one of my favorite subjects and uh, even for the teaching it's something that i really like to to do with the, um, the different uh, courses so what, what I'm talking about is actually solutions based on nature to tackle some of the problems we have in terms of sustainability, mostly the environmental system sustainability. So this uh, nature-based concept, which is something that should not be, uh, or it is not really new, it, it's something that's been there all the time. It's combining the ecology and the um, engineer uh, in a way to get to achieve these sustainable development goals and the societal goals that uh, we're facing. So you can, you can find a lot of um, definitions around these nature-based solutions, but they're mostly building with nature as a, opposed to other approaches, which is building in nature or building against nature or using nature, so we're actually using nature to um, to support the economic growth. Um, at the same time, we are doing the the environmental part, the ecology, and not forgetting the economic growth. There is a range of um, publications that are very interesting. And I always try to, to look for uh, these uh, reports of international organizations. And uh, I just put this one here, Nature-Based Solutions for Water. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really nice um, guide. And it's not really very much deep in techni technically, but it's, it's a really nice guide. And it comes to this, to, to this um, concept of promoting the biodiversity at the same time as we're looking at facing this uh, or tackling these uh, water challenges and th this is one of the if you if you remember for those who were here last time we talk about this planetary boundaries biodiversity is one of the the, the one that has exceeded the the genetic diversity the the threshold so if we can incorporate these solutions that promote biodiversity in other sectors and not take it so much uh, in compartments, then you can we can do it. So for the for the water, nature-based solutions, they are also <laughs> designed as the NBS, and really a way to address many of the challenges that we are uh, that we are facing concerning sustainability. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, we, we have to talk about ecosystem services because it, it's really what uh, the, we're talking about. Uh, we are going to talk about plants and the, the greenery. And it's really what they can give us <clears throat> for free, let's say, if we keep the, the, the biodiversity. So it's not only biodiversity, it's water, it's energy. And we'll look at, uh, at this. So when we're, we're doing this uh, or looking at these nature-based solutions. We're looking at this uh, concept uh, of ecosystem services, what we can get from nature. And as I said, it's not only 
plants and uh, aesthetics, it's not only biodiversity, it's also water quality, air quality, efficiency of using the resources. One of the big <clears throat> things in terms of urban context, for example, is reducing the urban heat island, is the, the noise reduction, flood mitigation, that's what I'll talk about today as well. So it's, it's not only plants, it's not only biodiversity, it's uh, trying to incorporate plants in a way that we get services uh, for free uh, from the ecosystem. And if you're looking into what could be a constructed environment, we're talking about more natural things like city parks uh, or a woodland, but we're also talking about green roofs on top of buildings. And it's not to look nice because mostly you don't see them if you, they're just doing their technical uh, services. It's, we're talking about uh, wastewater treatment. I don't see, maybe we don't see any here, but this drainage, um, drainage uh, kind of ponds that you put uh, at the soil level, they are also uh, doing water purification, even the roofs on top. It's green walls, so there are different solutions. Some are more uh, easy to implement and less, uh, less uh, costly. The other ones, of course, if this is an investment in nature, they are, uh, you have to invest in this then to get your re rewards. But these are the so-called blue and green solutions incorporated in the, especially in the urban environments. We'll go, we'll see in the example, but it's one of the problems we're facing is the permeabilized uh, urban environments so the water cannot go through. And that's why we're talking about flood retention. Um, and this can, uh, these greenery services can, can help a lot. So I'll just go to two uh, case studies that we've uh, implemented at our university. If you wish, uh, and if it's allowed for me to say this, you can interrupt me uh, through, the, through the conversation. Uh, because they will be, I will just looking at uh, how we did things. The first one is an example on constructed wetlands for wastewater. This is not only for wastewater treatment, uh, it's also for wa water runoff treatment, things like from, uh, from roads. Um, and it's also, and lately looked at also for buffer zones for, um, from agricultural production areas. So you get uh, to have very much a diffuse pollution through agriculture, uh, leaching of nutrients and, uh, and uh, organic, uh, sometimes organic compounds that are uh, pollutants. And what you can have is buffer zones that are a barrier between the agricultural zone and the, the, the water resources that are um, uh, most of the times nearby these big, um, these big uh, agricultural areas. And even in this concept, uh, we have incorporated the circular economy uh, approaches because people that are looking at uh, buffer zones from agricultural production, they're using plants that could be uh, of uh, some benefit, so as the biomass that can have further uh, applications by trying to combine uh, all these. But constructed wetlands as of, uh, are actually mimicking the natural wetlands. But we're just, uh, that's why they call constructed we are going to engineer the, um, these natural wetlands in a way that they can be used for water treatment in a certain place. But they actually mimic what happens in nature, which is a combination of vegetation, 
the soil and here I have substrate because in constructed wetlands you do not use soil anymore they used to be used but it is a substrate for the plants to grow and of course the below ground biodiversity the microorganisms which are in fact what are the leading um, the leading the workers the, the leading cause of uh, degradation of the pollution or of mitigation of the, the organic load that goes in, in the waste um, in the waste water. So what we're doing is just mimicking the biochemical um, the biogeochemical cycles within the wastewater treatment. This can be used in different countries and as I said it has several applications. Buffer salts, municipal and domestic wastewater, industrial wastewater, runoff, leachates. They have been used um, everywhere. And maybe if you don't uh, want to say anything now, you can let me know in the end if you, if you know them or if you have them installed in your own countries. We've got about 4,000 in Portugal. Not much for the type of climate we have. They are more prone to, to be more efficient in warmer climates. Um, they're more used in the Nordic countries actually. They work when it's snowing, although slower, because the, but the microbial activity goes uh, anyway underneath. So they are probably the less uh, technological or the less costly solution for wastewater treatment in terms of construction, operation, maintenance, they are very tolerant to flow uh, fluctuations, which happens many times. If you have a wastewater treatment in your own city, one of the, the issues for, for it to be operating well is that you always get to, um, to receive the same flow. Uh, so you have to have equalization uh, tanks. Um, but this, they tolerate that. They integrate well into the landscape. And they have multiple functions because they allow for these ecosystem services, including biodiversity and purification of the, the water. I put here ornamental features because it's the, the example I'm, I'll be giving has to do with, um, with this. Of course, there is a big drawback that I should have here. Uh, they take space. So it's the biggest thing. It, it, you really need space to put, in, to put this. But you can use it, just a scheme, you can use it uh, to treat water. For those who ever heard about this as the secondary treatment, this is just the main treatment, the main biological treatment of, um, of a wastewater treatment plant. See, you can use it, the constructed wetland to treat the flow, or you can use it after the main treatment, just as a polishing step. To, to take the rest of the nutrients. And you're growing the plants on it. So you are doing biomass production, contributing to carbon sequestration and to further uses of the biomass. I'm not going to go in much into detail of all the types that you can find. I'll just use two of uh, those that to, will su support the example, because you have free floating, submerged, immersion, and I'll be looking at this emergent macrophytes, um, constructed wetlands. You can have three types, free flow, horizontal flow, and vertical flow. And if you use, if you look at this scheme, this is an horizontal flow. This is very use, very simple to look at. You just have a compartment or a tank where you have a substrate Many times this is like uh, expanded clay. These are the things that you use for gardening. It supports plant growth. It could be sand. You can use stones. Basically, you use what you have available. As long as it supports plant growth and allow, allows a good drainage of the water. So the water goes in, comes out, and while passing through the rhizosphere of these plants, the, the organic matter is degraded, some of it is taken up by plants. 
So you're actually sequestering also nitrogen and phosphorus in, the, in this uh, biomass of the plants that you can use then further for composting or ornamental, whatever energy. But you're actually giving up a niche of uh, biodiversity while you're treating the water. You can, can also have the vertical flow uh, and the only reason I'm showing this, this is more complex vertical flow because you actually need uh, a prior tank to store the water. And then what you do is you fill the tank, then you close it, wait for three, four days, and then just drain the water and fill again. It's more complex because if you are filling the tank and then closing it, you must have another tank for the water to wait and come again. So uh, this is more complex, but this is uh, very useful if you need more oxygenation. Because when you are filling and uh, drawing, draining the water, then you're actually oxygenating the, the system. There is nothing else here. It, there is not much technological uh, compartments here, there are no pumps, most of it, the water just uh, just flows, that's why it's so low cost and uh, less uh, energy demanding. And you, of course, this is not a hole, you must have an impermeable layer. I'll show you some. They really integrate into the landscape. This is one example for a, for a winery. And it's mostly what you see here is phragmitis, is the plants that are mostly used for that. This is an horizontal flow. Uh, bed integrates well and allows for reduction of the, the main contaminants, just for, uh, for curiosity. If, you do not, if you're not in this field, this does not mean much to you, but this, are, this is the measure of organic matter. You see the inflow and the outflow. Usually you have a hundred as the uh, PPMs as the what you can uh, discharge. This is in the Czech Republic uh, wastewater treatment for uh, for um, domestic wastewater for fifty people. Roughly, if you want to know the size, it's like you should give one square meter per between one, five people. This is used for up to 10,000 people uh, in uh, usually not much bigger. So these are solutions for, for um, low uh, settings. Okay, this is just another one. This is one constructed wetland in Denmark that is used just to treat the water that comes from the drying of the sludge of the main wastewater treatment. And the reason why I think this is a nice picture is that it allows you to see that you do need space. It takes a lot of space if you're taking, talking about big quantities. This is a constructed wetland in the airport at Heathrow. This is an example of runoff water. Uh, you have also the phragmitis, and the, the water is uh, treated. And now I'll come to the, our example of uh, a constructed wetland. Use this is the setting. This is actually a picture of the, the setting. Is in a tourism house, and is treating the water from the tourism house, the the wastewater that is produced in the cleaning, in the in the production of food in people that are doing overnights there. And this is very good for this example is rural, rural context, where you can have many people have septic tanks. And then uh, if you know this uh, context, usually then you have to, to drain the septic tank once in a while. Instead of that, you can have uh, a constructed wetland to treat the, the water. So this is where we put it. This is the house. We, we've worked many years 
in, uh, in wastewater treatment with constructed wetlands for the industry. This was our first example for uh, domestic wastewater. So this is the house. Uh, there were, there's, um, they produce um, vineyard, they have vineyards here. You'll, have, you'll see in another picture, but we try another constructed wetland for the vineyard, for the water from the vineyards. And the constructed wetland was put here. There was no sewage network, so it was the alternative wastewater treatment that, uh, that they uh, saw as um, feasible to be implemented here. So this is the place, is, uh, is not uh, too big, this is about 70, 70 square meter, and the water is produced in the house. So uh, the reason to show this is that there are no pumps, the water comes down to the set. And so the constructed wetland is here. The house is here. This is the dimension. This is all the farm. These are the vineyards. And this is where we, we put it. So no air energy, just everything comes through gravity. The house can have between 60 and 40 people. So as I said, it can this tolerates um, the, the difference in the flow. And we use it for the, the domestic wastewater coming from all the facilities, the black, from the, the toilets, and from the gray water from washing the clothes and from cooking, everything. So this was the, the type we, we decided, horizontal flow. One of the issues is uh, usually the insects, mosquitoes, and you have to construct your wetland in a way that the water if you see in the blue here, the water level is not uh, at the top because if you have water in the in the surface, there might be some uh, larvae just uh, proliferating, and then you get the insects and you get also the odors. This is a tourism house. We had this uh, running for ten years, and the tourist tourists are there, so people are leaving are going there. There's no smell, and there are no insects, and we decided because this was um, a, a farm and it was domestic wastewater, to, um, to use uh, the ornamental plants that they had around. So we did not go for those phragmites that you've just seen, the, which are very, very tolerant to pollution. We tried the different plants that they, were, they had in the, in the house. So we decided for those plants. I have to say we tried every, all the plants, not all were able to stand the organic load. We decided on the place. You start by digging a hole. Usually this is about 50 centimeters deep, 50 to 75. It's, it's not um, much used to do it uh, at a bigger depth because what you want is to get the roots. Uh, you, you want to get water through the roots where the microbial activity is higher. So there's no point in doing it very deep. You don't want dead zones. Then you just uh, prepare for the impermeabilization. Uh, it's most of the times the, the thing that is most costly, it depends on the country you are. So we, we got a, a kind of a professional impermeabilization uh, of the, the wetland with a geomembrane, geotextile. Then, in this particular one, we decided on the expanded clay with a certain granulometry. We've used this, uh, this expanded clay for a long time in, uh, in the constructed wetlands, and we mixed with sand. We mixed with some sand. Sometimes it's more costly to have the sand if you have to get it from, uh, from uh, a different, a distant place. Then it's prepared. So you just have to plant. Uh, and of course, there are the tubings going through to, to do the water. This is, um, this is uh, well, the place that goes in. Now the, the word is missing in English. But this is the entrance of the, the, the wastewater. It comes underneath from the septic tank. Planting is always, it, everything looks bad. We use, as I said, a mixture of plants. We had to plant in summer. Uh, we had some delays in, uh, in 
people coming through to do the work for the filling and the improvisation. So it was like that summer was like 40 degrees. So I thought this was going to be a, a disaster. But then plants start, uh, start appearing. We start, we connected the, the wastewater treatment plant. This seems a different wastewater treatment plant, but it is exactly the same one. Uh, it's just because we use the polyculture, depending on the time of the year, you get different colors. You see here, a mixture of the plants. This is the same plant, but it really depends on when you take the picture, you get it yellow or uh, red. Uh, the, the plants grow, they grow a lot actually because they are getting the organic nutrients through the wastewater. Um, oh, sorry, this is a, this is just one side by side, so you can see it is the same, but with the different times of the year. But I was saying they grow a lot. You here, you can see uh, how they grow because you have someone here. You can, um, you can walk through that. As I said, we leave the water at about um, uh, uh, just a few centimeters. Underneath, you put some slope just so you keep it uh, at a certain level. But they grow a lot. We cut it once or twice a year. And then this goes, this biomass, in this case, goes for, for uh, composting. Uh, during the year, the plants are used to um, buy the house to just as ornamental plants. You see the vineyards here? That's the, where they produce the, the wine. And we have a model, one that we haven't study so much here to collect the water from the vineyard from the wine production during uh, during the September October when they produce so this is uh, the what you get in terms of reduction of organic matter did you see the concentration in the chemical okay this is a measure for those who don't know it's just a measure of uh, organic content and you get a reduction, a very big reduction of the, um, the, the loads to levels that are allowed for discharge. So this is about 450, it goes to below 50 for the concentration and it allows for the reduction of the phosphate and the, the ammonia, which are the, the main nutrients in the wastewater. And you can, without an input of energy and just with the people from the house to cut the plants, you get to treat uh, a very high amount of um, wastewater in an in a energy efficient uh, way. We look at uh, several things in this, um, in this wastewater treatment plant. I didn't bring, bring it all in uh, today, but we look at microorganisms, we look at microbial communities in the plants because they use it for ornamental uh, purposes. We look at Listeria, Salmonella to see whether there was an uptake of the plants. There, there were se several parameters, but basically what they are doing there is uh, doing the wastewater treatment and also promoting biodiversity. We also like to go there and uh, take pictures of whatever comes through. Here you can see well what the expanded play looks like. Um, this, let me see, this, oh no, I cannot do this. Uh, this um, kind of, uh, how do you say? It looks like, probably you've seen it in, uh, in, in all the gardening shops. Uh, it's just, uh, very porous and you get different types in terms of granulometry and allows very, very well allows very well the trainers of course it also allows for the microbial assemblages to be to be formed but you get a lot of biodiversity so it means the water is uh, actually clean and with the uh, low low toxicity further to that constructed wetland uh, a few years after constructing it we also decided to do kind of a pond um, that could be used as water storage, but also for further policy. 
because the water goes to the then the water that is treated goes to the vineyards. It's just used for uh, irrigation of the, um, the vineyards. So this is a, an example of um, a nature-based solution applied to the wastewater treatment uh, sector. And you can uh, then extrapolate this. This is a tourism house. You can have an industry. We have four slaughterhouses together with domestic, uh, domestic water in the south of Portugal. I know them are not being involved in those. We have for industrial. There is a, there are a lot of uh, applications. Uh, they are not a solution for everything. You need space, um, but there are, they are a solution for uh, for uh, many of the situations where you don't uh, need them to spend so much energy and where you can treat water because in many places you should, the only the only thing is that going to happen is that you're not going to treat water let's see so oh, this is a repetition the pond allows uh, better for uh, for this uh, circular circular economy that's why we put now just a very very briefly the the second case is the green roofs and the green roofs it's also a nature-based solution that is very much uh, good for urban contexts. And it is also a, a way of promoting the reuse of non-potable water, uh, or the use of non-potable water that, that, let's say, people don't put uh, this, uh, this um, uh, solution to treat the wastewater on top of the houses, they put it to harvest the rainwater uh, and it's not only about using water let's see so there is a lot we can if you have the water if it if it rains 50 percent of the water that we use in our house if there was something that i also showed last time can be replaced by non-potable water so uh, we could save a lot of the water that comes through our tap and can be used for drinking um, not to use for these uh, other functions. So green roofs have been used for that. Just a few examples. They are installed everywhere in the world. Uh, this is an example of Japan that where it's used to fight water scarcity. So in, in some parts of the world, it will be for water scarcity. But in some parts of the world where it range a lot, you want your most used is to control the floods, especially the urban floods in uh, very highly paved uh, industrial settings. Berlin, if you looked in the internet, is um, known as the sponge city because they have so much greenery all around. And the main, uh, the main purpose is when it rains, you can, or drains a lot, you can storage the water for other purposes, but you delay the runoff. So you avoid the, the flooding. And this is becoming very important, uh, especially because the urban world population is growing at a much higher pace than what is happening with the rural areas that are actually steady in terms of, um, of numbers. So the green roofs, and for those, for those who are aware of that, you might know, you might read the news. In many places of the world, they've been compulsory for, for new buildings of certain dimensions, especially municipal buildings. You must have either green roofs or uh, solar panels. So you must have solutions to decrease the, your energy input or your energy use. And uh, green roofs, have a lot to do with energy because in a house where or in a uh, in a setting in a building where you have a green roof your energy savings are are really big can be really big if that is well implemented because you don't have to eat so much during winter and you save air conditioning during summer because they insulate the the, the house so this is really uh, a multi multi purpose uh, multi purpose construction 
And if you look at the original thing, you're actually building them because of the problem we have of highly impermeable cities where if it rains, the water does not have where to go. So if there, is, there, there are impervious surfaces, what you have is the runoff water on top of your city and you get If you have soil and vegetation, the runoff that stays on top is much less. The rest is infiltrated. What's happening in our urban areas? And I'm talking about port, for example, most of it, it is impermeable. So you get an impervious surface and you get the floods. So these green roofs have uh, all these multipurpose functions, rainwater management, they can remove air pollutants, they increase biodiversity, as you've seen for the constructed wetlands, and they decrease the energy consumption. And this has been now studied, they increase the lifetime of the roofing materials. So many of, many of us go through cities with uh, lots of green roofs, but we don't see them because they are on, uh, on top. And again, they are a nature-based solution because they mimic completely what happens in nature. They mimic the natural soil layers. If you hear about the green roof, it's not just uh, a pot with plants. It's a set of technical layers where you have filters, so the, the, the roots do not come through and you don't dirty your water. Then you have the drainage layers. This is also very technical, where you actually are storing the water and you can reuse, then you have to have this link to other infrastructures. You have a protection layer for the, for the building and then a waterproofing. So it's, it's not just putting uh, plants on top of a building. It, if it's not a new building, it really needs a careful look at because you just can't uh, put too much weight on top of the roof. And you must make sure that you're not going to inundate your building and get the, get the, the water coming into your building. But this, if you look here at um, a soil, uh, layer the soil layers see that it looks like just what happens in uh, in uh, in nature and this uh, as i said has been uh, has been uh, used now much more intensive these days everywhere and uh, the word intensive was not to do with this intensive that is uh, written here you can find different types of green roofs they go from intensive to extensive. And the word here, intensive, it means that it needs maintenance. So it depends on the purpose. If you need, if you want a green roof where people can go and walk and see trees and to be a, a, a zone for a recreation, then you're talking about roofs with the higher depth and uh, more intensive in terms of maintenance and the installation. Then you have the semi-intensive already a, uh, um, a lower depth and then you have what we call the extensive ones. The example I'll give is extensive. They're just there to serve these uh, purposes of uh, keeping water and, um, and all the other services that we talked about, but not for people to go there and walk through or just to, to be there. But all of them, they, they must have all the, all the layers I talked about. If you look at some, some figures, the storm water volumes, the, the flooding, they can be reduced by 85%. So it is a really, really a lot. Of course, this is just a drawing. You can have this type, it's a, okay. It takes much more in terms of uh, installation and uh, operation uh, maintenance. They do exist, and people are looking very much at this, at these solutions in um, health uh, health buildings, uh, hospitals, for people to get uh, better with nature, not being just in a in a in a buildings with uh, for health related 
in terms of technical health uh, health uh, solutions. So here it's in this uh, in this picture you see very well. If you have a peak of rainfall in a conventional roof, you have the water coming through immediately, a very big peak. The green roof, you delay. It does not mean that water is not going to come through. Of course it will, but through time and with lower peaks. That is what is called the flood retention and the, the delay of the peak. This for, I would say that for many, many places in the world, that's why they use to control the floods. Because sometimes they don't even take the water to, um, they don't even reuse the water in the building. That, uh, that needs for, um, this needs for some, um, some other uh, infrastructures. Uh, there are some, you, you can get more in terms of uh, literature, uh, in terms of the percentages of um, water retention. This is a study of ours and we got 30%. It was a very, if you see here, 10 centimeters, a very roof, a very low depth of water, of uh, roof. But in other studies, you can go higher, up to 90% 90 water, water retention. So let me just go to this one, just to show some, because you don't get to see them. You just look, there is a prize for the green roofs every year. You can see the best pictures. You can have a, go to a site and see which ones were, were the prize winners. And what cities are doing is that they are trying to put them in very emblematic buildings. So to be used as a model. So then you go to the New York police station, they have a green building, you put in libraries all, all over in very emblematic. Um, this is a library actually, this is in Vancouver. Um, this is in, uh, where is this? It's another library as well. Uh, Seattle, public library. If you go to Delft, they also have, it's not here, it's also the libraries, they have a very nice one. So when you see this, it, it's not just plants growing on top of a building. They really need all those technical uh, layers to keep it functioning, otherwise it will not go. But you have, uh, in USA, you have, a, you have a lot in a very emblematic, uh, buildings. This is not an emblematic building, but this is our own ones. This is our facility, our old facilities at university. We moved facility one year ago, and this is our old one. We bring in the infrastructures to the, to the new building. And what you see here, this is for research. It's, we use the green roofs. We, do, we study different substrates. Because at the moment, the, at least in Portugal, you can to put a green roof, you only have one or two companies. The, the materials come from other countries. So it's very much, uh, I would say it's uh, expensive in, in the, to, to put this. So you need other solutions. So we're looking at other materials, materials that allow for low weight and uh, plant growth. And we only look, in our case, that with aromatic plants, there are um, native plants to, um, here that can uh, survive the harsh conditions of top roofs, in the, especially in the winter. So these are our roofs. They don't look like the, the ones I've just uh, showed you. Uh, we put it in with aromatic plants and we do the studies on the rainwater retention the different substrates we use and we do with the, the more the, the engineering school we do the, um, the studies on the thermal insulation of these kind of uh, constructions when we use the aromatic plants and the, um, the different substrates we use expanded clay we use eggshells uh, and some more more um, available materials from our um, from our country, even uh, what comes from the uh, Quercus, oak. What comes from oak? Now I, I forgot the name. 
we use what is the stoppers for, for the winery, for the natural stoppers for the, the wine. Cork, cork, we are big, the biggest producers of cork, so we also use cork to, to because it helps insulating and uh, if it's put in small pieces, it also allows for the drainage of the water. So aromatic plants grow very well. We have them for about six years, also in our, in our university. And we did some experiments, not in, this, not in these bigger settings, but in um, one cubic meter, this is very low tech here, this picture, one cubic meter um, kind of containers for um, chemicals that were washed and given up to us. And <clears throat> we had an experimental setup. Now it's been more than one year. We're confirming for more years to uh, allow for, uh, to, for us to calculate what is this uh, runoff coefficient for the water in our Mediterranean uh, climate. So we got this into models and we have now, wait, I'll come back to this one. We have now only the, it was out this year, a guide, this is in Portuguese, because we used to have the German guidelines. We followed the German guidelines. They were the ones that have this really developed. So Coberturas Verdes mean green roofs, technical guide for Portugal. <laughs> And um, our uh, pilot study at university with the, this uh, um, one cubic meter containers on all, all in series with different plants, uh, getting to collect water for two years, they incorporated our um, now our model equation into the um, the modeling for the green roofs in uh, in Portugal, which was quite nice. And this is also very good to involve students. Students are always helping through their, through our, what we call research club, the undergrad students, the first cycle and second cycle can go. And those, those that really like field work uh, help in this kind of studies. And then we, we get them <clears throat> the recognition uh, for that, that they can uh, lead them, uh, take to their job interviews and uh, when they go out to work. So these are two of the nature-based solutions that we are um, using and doing research on. Uh, this one, the green roofs, much more, much more recent one, maybe and then four, maybe uh, eight to nine years. Constructed wetlands, we've been uh, working with it uh, since uh, the 90s, so it's much more experience. But we're trying to contribute to, um, to the policies, the urban policies. If we can uh, help, then it's, uh, it's a gain, because uh, the way it's going, especially those people that live in very densely populated uh, urban areas, uh, we have to do something about it. So, this is a, a small contribution, but it's not only research. We use this a lot to get awareness of the, uh, to get demonstration and awareness of the population in general with visits to the sites, to the tourism house, and to, to teachers of the secondary schools that can get to, to incorporate this in examples people from schools that come to, to um, the students come to visit as well. So it's like a, uh, an experimental model for, for different things. And we, we keep it, especially with constructed wetland, we're not publishing with constructed wetland anymore. We just use it for demonstration uh, um, purposes for different levels of the society. The tourism house use it as a, um, they, have, they do a lot on sustainability, solar, solar, solar panels, uh, biological production of food, they do a lot. Uh, so they use it also as a kind of a marketing example of the good practices in terms of environment. environment. So there's a win-win situation. Okay, but I'll stop here. 
um, these were the case studies I was going, I, I, I thought I would bring on these nature-based solutions. I hope they were any use to you. Um, if you want to, to ask something, I am, uh, I am available to, to any question. Sorry, I just looked at the time now. I took a bit, 15, 15 minutes. I thought about, about 10 minutes less, but I got, I got enthusiastic. Thanks for listening. If you have any question, uh, please go ahead. No question, but uh, uh, for me, it's, uh, it was very interesting and useful information. Uh, there was uh, uh, um, the project for Gyumri last year, before the coronavirus, mm -hmm. uh, Green City. Uh, uh, yeah. And the, the, the city government will do it. Mm -hmm. the, yes. Uh, I hope, I hope uh, it will be okay. Uh, yeah. But I uh, I want to um, inform you uh, that uh, in Armenia Armenia have a beautiful biodiversity. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, these these years, I uh, I show that the insect uh, it's diminue. I think that method uh, can help also yeah. opening an uh, opening very yeah. well biodiversity. Yes, I think. Yes, it's not only the plants. The the pictures that I show where you see the also the insects coming and uh, it's uh, it's nice. It's not just biodiversity in terms of plants. It's also for the 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 animals. Let's say. No. Thanks a lot, Paula. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if. Uh... Thank you, Paula, for a very interesting presentation. It was, was really very, very interesting. And as Thank I you. mentioned, in Armenia, we now give a priority for the greening economy and greening yeah. of everything that is connected with uh, improving uh, sustainable development yes. in Armenia and yeah. this part. And uh, of course, your sample related to the water examples also was very, very interesting and very useful information. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think this is, I showed the water but I think it's not uh, only through the water that we convince people because it's not only water. Yeah. It's water, is energy, everything is related, it's biodiversity. So but it's you like... Know, uh, for you, it was very difficult to present all possibilities and all approach related. Yes, to yes. It's, um, it's very difficult. I, was, I think I was saying, for the, I know you were here last time, uh, about water. It's very difficult to say, okay, let's do all this to collect water. And they say, oh, why? It rains a lot in port. We don't need to, to, to save the water. But it's not only water. It's the energy because uh, producing yeah. water and, uh, <clears throat> takes a lot of energy to produce and to transport. And also the energy in the buildings with the green roofs, it's really a benefit. In Germany, there are studies that say 70% savings of energy. Even if it's just 30, it's, it would be okay. Even if they are wrong by 50%, it depends on where you are, of course. It's, it's a, a lot of savings. But as I said, we, don't, we do not use so much this for research nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, it's more as a, um, a flag or uh, the model to show people that uh, more the society in general, not so much the scientific research. Yeah. 
related to the uh, urban trees, uh, what about Angin also say about the Gyumri, it's a really big problem in Armenia related to the urban trees benefits. People mentality need to be increased in order they will be understand this issue. Yeah. We, we, we some lecture in the classes uh, for the students in the school, we always say that there are five big benefits. First of all, cool of the air. Yeah. Yes. Filter urban pollutants. Yeah. Increase property values. Increase urban biodiversity. Yes. Improve physical and mental health, which is nowadays yes. very important. The part for the mental is very important. Yeah. I didn't bring it here. We have a project. It's still going. The it's one of the biodiversity call. Is with the uh, Belgium and um, France, where we're looking at urban trees. It's called the urban microserve. We're just looking at the same trees in uh, in the trees in Strasbourg, uh, Leuven, and Porto. We have the trees with sensors to um, to uh, monitor the growth, and we through different uh, temperature is online. So every uh, I think it's every two minutes it grows it uh, measures, and um, we relate that with the soil pollution because we have metals. And we relate that also with the, the um, ectomycorrhiza um, biodiversity in the in the soil because we're looking at places where they have planting in box the box system and the, the at least in Porto in some streets and also in Strasbourg and Leuven the trees are very much exposed to stress because they are in these boxes that do not have so much soil and very low biodiversity. Uh -huh. And uh, we're looking at uh, tools. We actually work a lot with Inocula. We, we, you, you will hear about that in the, in the next two, but not this particular project. We, um, we introduce ec uh, ectomycorrhiza mushrooms uh, to, uh, to trees in the, in, the, in the city to see whether that can improve the health status of the trees because the trees in there is many problems with the health of the trees in the urban environments due to stress as well. Yeah. But the benefits are the same, as yeah. you said. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you, Zoe, you are the manager. <laughs> Since there are no questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your attention. For your uh, for being here. Uh, Thank you, too. We are looking.